Uh, well, I'm, I'm Karen Sofa, the library director. Thank you for coming out tonight. We're pleased to welcome back author Jane Healy, um, lo local Massachusetts author. Uh, she's the author of Beantown Girls. It's a Washington Post and Amazon Charts bestseller. She was here most recently for her book, The Secret Stealers. Um, that was an Amazon First Reads editor's pick and a historical novel society's editor's choice. And she's here tonight to talk about her most recent book, The uh, Good Night from Paris. And as like I said, she's a local author. We really love to have local authors come. Um, we really appreciate her being here. And uh, please will join me in welcoming Jane Healy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank you for your patience, because that was a little stressful. But we're good now. Um, like I said, we, I, I'm from Melrose, which is about eight miles north of the city. And I thought I gave myself plenty of time tonight. But clearly, cut it a little too close. So um, I'm here to talk about Good Night from Paris. This is about um, the seventh time I've given, given this talk. It came out on March 7th. And um, I'm going to start with a little bit, a little story from um, actually from 2020. And it kind of is emblematic of why I wanted to tell this story. So this is Lauren Frame. This was from February 2020. He's in his 90s. He was, uh, he's Canadian. He was um, with the Royal Canadian Armed Forces during World War II. And in 2020, he received the National Order of the Legion of Honor from France for his time as a bom bomber pilot during World War II. And this is, um, I just realized the audio might be off for this. Um, I will just tweak this really quickly, so sorry. You know what, I'm, I'll, I'll read it out loud to you. This, there's a speech that they do honoring him. Um, and, At the age of oh, 14, it works. And on his 13th mission, his plane was attacked by German night fighters. His plane was shot down on the edge of the Fontainebleau forest south of Paris. As he fought to control the descending plane, he ordered his crew to evacuate. He was the last person out of the plane. After walking all night, Mr. Frame found himself in the village of Barbizon. There he came into contact with an American woman by the name of Drew Tartier. Mrs. Tartier spent the war years assisting the French underground. As she spoke English, Mr. Frame was able to convince her that he was a member of the Allied forces and not a German soldier. Mrs. Tartier hid Mr. Frame in the back of her house, where he was eventually joined by members of his crew. They stayed hidden for seven weeks until Barbizon was liberated in August 1944. As benefits a true hero, Mr. Frame minimizes his contributions and sacrifices. To this day, he praises the women and men of the French underground, and in particular, Drew Tartier. So this is my fourth historical fiction novel, but what's different about this one is that it's biographical fiction and it's inspired and based on the true story of Drew Leighton Tartier. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about who she was, how I learned about her, and the history behind the novel, but I promise you I'm not giving away any spoilers, I'm not giving away the story, because why would you read the book if I like told you all about it tonight? So there's like nothing you will, no spoilers, no, nothing about the character arc, just really about the history that will hopefully get you excited to read the book. Um, really, this is Lauren um, at, he has an autobiography of Drew Layton's that she wrote with someone right in 1946 after the war. I also have that autobiography. I paid too many euros um, from a, a guy on eBay. I found, like, there's not many copies left in the world, and I found him, I paid like 100 euros on eBay, this guy in the UK. and. Um, but I really had to have it because I couldn't find too, enough about her. And there's pictures in the middle of this autobiography, and this is one of them. And this is Lauren with Drew Tartier at the end of the war celebrating. I have a better picture of them coming up later. Um, so a little bit about me before I get into um, Drew Layton. I 20 years ago I left a career in high tech um, that I was I was a product manager in my youth. And um, I was work freelance writing at Boston Magazine and other magazines and newspapers. I, was, um, I had a six, uh, little, two little girls, now, they're now 16 and 19. And that was the time that I was, I'd always wanted to write fiction, but I finally, I think having kids, it was like, okay, when are you gonna do this? When are you actually gonna make it, you know, make it important in your life? So I started working on fiction, taking workshops, I had a writer's group and started working on what became the Saturday Evening Girls Club really 
in the fringes of my life. And that came out in 2017, and it's based on the true stories of the Saturday Evening Girls Club. They were Jewish and Italian immigrant women in Boston's North End at the turn of the 20th century. So that one did well enough that my publisher was looking for another project for me, and I I had always wanted to write a bigger story. I wanted to write a World War II story because my grandfather was in World War II. And I had learned about these Red Cross Clubmobile girls that were serving coffee and donuts at the front lines of the war. And I'm like, that's fascinating. And so that, the, I wrote a book called The Beantown Girls in 2019 that was inspired <laughs> by their stories. And that, um, that was number one on Amazon. It was number seven on the Washington Post. That book kind of was my breakout book. And, so then, during the pandemic, um, my publisher was looking for something else for me, and I, ha I had kind of filed away some stories about the women of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was a precursor to the CIA in World War II, and that book became The Secret Stealers, came out in 2021. It was a first reads editor's pick on Amazon. It was a Cosmo Best Historical Fiction of 2021. Um, I came here to speak about it all my other events during like pandemic time was were all scheduled and of course didn't happen and that's why i'm so excited to be back in person and doing in-person events because there's nothing like it so so drew layton this i was writing the secret stealers and trying to figure out you know what was i always file away different ideas for the next projects what am i gonna what's gonna be coming next and when i was researching the secret stealers i came across this story in a couple different sources and it was the story of how after in september of 42 after pearl harbor the germans rounded up several hundred american women expatriates living in paris and beyond in the villages beyond and arrested them and they put them on buses and they took them to a zoo outside of paris and they imprisoned them in the monkey house in the zoo and their friends and family had to pay five francs um, to go to the zoo and like yell over the fence and talk to them and be like, you know, and they would be like, bring me more socks and you know, all, and um, it was so wild and I couldn't believe I hadn't heard of this story and I read about it in a couple sources and one of the women in the prison, in the, in the monkey house prison, was Drew Leighton Tartier and she was an American actress who, who had moved to France, a couple other people, a couple other well-known Americans were there, Sylvia Beach, the owner of Shakespeare and Company, bookstore in Paris. Um, she was also a prisoner there. After they were in the zoo for a couple days, these women were transported to the mountains of France and they were in an internment camp in the mountains, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, and, and Drew was also transferred, transferred there. And so that story was so like stranger than fiction. And I, it, you know, you think you've heard all the World War II stories. And honestly, there's a lot of World War II. I wasn't really planning on writing another World War II novel because it's a crowded genre, subgenre, but this I, I couldn't let go of this story. And then the more I dug into who Drew Layton was, the more I was like, I just have to pitch it to my editors because she's remarkable. And um, and so obviously they they went for it. And so I started my research on Drew and started drafting the novel. Um, she was born Drew uh, Dorothy Elizabeth Blackman um, in June on June 12, 1903, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Her family lived in Mexico, and she was ed educated in Switzerland, so they were, they were pretty well-to-do. At 19 years old, she married for the first time, and um, she, her husband at the t that she married was 34 years old, and it was pretty much a failed marriage for this, from the start. They had a young son together, but then Drew had al always dreamed of going to Hollywood, so she got divorced and left her young son and her husband and went to Hollywood. Um, this is one of her shots from her Hollywood days. She was stunning. And these are some of the movies. She was, um, in the 30s, she was a star on the rise in Hollywood. This is another still from one of her Charlie Chan movies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, and like the Charlie Chan movies are still sometimes on TV. You can see them on YouTube. There's a lot of clips. Um, they were, they thought, they said she was like the next Greta, they compared her to the next Greta Garbo. Yeah, this, this ad is really funny. It says, Drew Layton, a beauty whose eyes are alive, fresh, and sparkling, and kept that way with proper care. And I guess, like, you know, so, so 30s, so funny. Um, 
And this, I like this little, like, this was a little clip from one of a, a newspaper article, and it kind of shows her, her strong personality. So she was on her, a movie set, everyone's working, and she just tells the director one day she's taking off to take her two hairstylists out to lunch and get their fortunes read and, you know, leaves everyone in the lurch. So, um, yeah, I'm sure they weren't thrilled about that, but the hairstylists look pretty happy, so that was good. <laughs> Um, this is funny too, she's a huge animal lover. If you've read Goodnight from Paris already, there's a dog in the book, because there there's always a dog in her life. This is her Great Dane, I don't know his name, but, um, but I was able to see some of her scrapbooks from her Hollywood days, and there's more pictures of this dog than there are any of her family. Like, she really loved this dog, and she, the, apparently the dog was a terror on movie sets. And this is a little cartoon someone, uh, Drew Beauty and the Beast, Drew Layton and her prize-winning Great Dane, on which she has taken out a $20,000 bite insurance after he got tough with Charlie Chan. <laughs> so, yeah. So Charlie Chan, the Charlie Chan movies really started, her star started to rise with those. It really put her on the map. These are some of the ones, Charlie Chan in London, Charlie Chan's Courage, Charlie Chan at the Circus. This is a... Um, movie poster for and you know she's on the poster up in the corner there this is a short clip mr chan have you seen lake yes what did he say what did you find out nothing he is dead what i just thought that was funny so, <laughs> so you know her star is on the rise in hollywood and she's doing really well she takes a mini break to um, perform on broadway and she meets Jacques Tartier. And um, when I pulled up this slide the other day, I was at a, like a ladies' breakfast thing, and someone's like, I'd run away to Paris with him. And I'm like, yeah, you would, look at him. So um, he, he, was in, he met her in New York City, and then he went to the West, they, she was performing in the West End in London. It was a whirlwind romance, and they were married by 1938, and living in Paris by 1939, which of course was when the war starts for for France. This is one of the only pictures of Jacques and Drew together um, that I've ever been able to found, find from a French newspaper. So Jacques um, had lung issues and so he could not join the French army but he joined um, the British forces as a translator because he wanted to serve his country. So he went off to war and Jacques and Drew's family all said it's, you gotta get out, you gotta go to America wait out the war here, and, and then you can go back after. And she refused. She said, I want to be close to where my husband is. I am not leaving. She had a big network of friends in and around Paris. And, and her housekeeper, Nadine, who's in the story, um, becomes like a sister to her. So she stays in France. This is the real Nadine. So, she, you know, not a lot of jobs for American actresses in France. So she takes a job at Paris Mondial, which was governed by the French Ministry of Information. They were looking kind of for an American personality to broadcast to the US at night, um, kind of like the first voice of America telling them what was really going on in France, what was really going on in the continent of Europe during the war. Um, you know, if you remember, Americans were very isolationist in the 1939, 1940. They were weary of war. They didn't want to get involved in another world war. Um, and, you know, there were people like Charles Lindbergh who were very anti-Semitic and, and, and rising political star in America and advocating for no involvement. So Drew tries to, you know, she does some light program like, like A Day in the Life in France and things like that, but she also brings in some heavy, heavy hitting journalists like Dorothy Thompson, who I'll talk about a little bit later, um, to try to convince the American audience that American involvement is inevitable, and this, this is, you know, things are getting worse by the day in Europe. And, um, and she becomes so good at her, this job and communicating to the American audience that the, on Berlin radio, the Germans start announcing that she is one of the people that will be executed as soon as, the, uh, as, soon as they occupy France. So she keeps broadcasting until Paris falls in June of 1940. And so she flees the city with a whole group from Radio Mondiale. They go, they go south. Um, and she eventually relocates to a villa, the village of Barbizon, which is about an hour and a half outside of Paris. 
And so she's terrified because she knows now it, it, the Germans have occupied France. They are going to execute her if they figure it out. So she starts only using the name Tartier from this point on, hoping that they won't make the connection between Drew Layton on the radio and Drew Tartier married to Jacques. This is just kind of a, a big picture of what was going on in France at this time. So the occupied zone was in the north, including, of course, all the coastline. And then in the south, there was the Vichy, the Vichy government, which was a French government, that governed the so-called free zone in the south. But really, from the start, it was a puppet government. And, and by, the, by 1942, Germany had occupied all of France. So on June 13th, Parisians go to bed. And June 14th, they awake to the sounds of German accented voice saying that curfew is imposed and the Germans had occupied France by that evening. These are um, pretty famous pictures because Hitler only visited Paris like one time. So, And then these next pictures are pictures of Paris under occupation. And they're, they were used by the Nazis as propaganda to tr show the world that France is fine. Everyone in France is doing fine under occupation when, of course, just beneath the surface, things were not fine at all, particularly if you were Jewish. So these signs, of course, went up on every corner, the German direction signs. And one of the small acts of resistance by teenagers was to like move the arrows in the wrong ways, which I thought was really funny. Um, of course, the Germans had all the petrol, all the gas. So um, there's lots of bikes and horse and buggies and all sorts of contraptions because um, French people had no gas. So at this point, Drew decides, I need to get out of the city. I need to lay low for a little while. So she relocates to this little village of Barbizon. Um, charming village. No, a lot of artists had, had lived there over the years. So this was Villa Squirrel, where she, where she leased this little uh, villa on Main Street in Barbizon. Um, you can rent it on Airbnb for $107 a night. <laughs> I just learned that. Um, so um, Germans were, she was surrounded by Germans. It was a very, it was a lovely village, lots of great restaurants. So there were Germans everywhere. She, she laid low, her and Nadine grew vegetables in the courtyard and raised chickens and ducks because their friends and family in Paris were going hungry. Their food was more and more scarce. Um, this is a weird aside story. So um, I, I, this, this, house, this street looked really familiar to me, and I'd never been to Barbizon, and I didn't get to go because of the pandemic, but, um, I, I, and I couldn't place it, and then um, we have two prints, um, black and white prints, in our hallway going up to the second floor uh, in our house that have been there for a decade. My husband lived in France for a while, he got them at an antique store, and one of them is a Villa Squirrel, which is so crazy, crazy, and I never even noticed that it said Barbizon in the corner over here. Um, until I was walking up the stairs as I was writing the book, and I'm like, that was, it was like crazy. Um, so this is Drew um, with one of her neighbors in Barbizon. Um, she's, you know, still living in Barbizon. I call this the calm before the storm for her. Her boss from um, her radio, radio mondiale, Jean Frise, phrase, it's phrase, I connect, I checked with my French friend, and I still pronounce it Frise. Um, Jean Frey's comes out to, to kind of hide out and work with the resistance, um, living at Villa Squirrel. And then Drew and Nadine and Jean decide to lease a farmhouse outside of the, the village so that they can raise more crops, they can have more animals, they can feed more friends, and Jean can con conduct more resistance activities. And this was Drew's first kind of foray into helping the resistance, which was still it hadn't quite really, it was still in its early days, so it wasn't very well organized. They didn't have the support from the Allies yet. So then, um, the story I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, September 42, Drew is arrested in Barbizon and thrown on the bus with all these other American women from all over Paris and beyond. And they're imprisoned in the zoo um, outside of Paris for two days. And like I said, some of the stories were so heartbreaking from that from the zoo and some were pretty funny because they were like what are you going to do like they were making jokes about the monkey pee smell and like all this other stuff it was like this weird comedy tragedy situation um so from there she's taken to this 
prison camp in the mountains. Um, hundreds of British and American women are kept there. Um, to be clear, though, this was a camp that was constantly monitored by the International Red Cross. So while it, it was still a prison and it wasn't great conditions, it was not the horrific conditions of some of the other camps that you read about. So, um, so they're taken there. They have food from the Red Cross. They have, um, you know, they have relatively decent shelter. But from the beginning, she's kind of convinced. She's, you know, convinced that she has to get out to help help with the resistance again, and she's going to do anything anything possible to get out of there. So she actually um, becomes friends with one of the doctors who's working there. He's, he's Jewish, and he's working at the camp because. He, he has to. They basically threaten his family if he doesn't work at the camp for the Germans. And so she convinces him to give her meds so she can fake cancer. So she can fake ovarian cancer and, and escape the prison and so they'll release her and, on a medical leave. And she, but she takes it too far. She's an actress, so she does a great job at it. But then she also starts losing weight, becoming anemic. By the time she got out, they released, this is her release papers in December 1942, um, she was really, really sick, but um, the interesting thing was she, she's released on medical, uh, she, it's a medical release, and they think she's dying, so um, she has to report to Avenue Foch in Paris once a week from Barbizon, but they basically give her a free pass to go back and forth to par Paris anytime she wants, and if you're working with the resistance, that's pretty great because nobody get, was getting that, ever, and so um, if you see this, it's like all officials are requested to permit the aforementioned to make a return journey unhindered and to afford her there in help and protection. Um, so, you know, she was very, very ill and she risked her life to get out of there, but, um, but this was like, you know, gold to get this kind of pass. So she gets back to Barbizon. Um, again, they still haven't made the connection between Leighton, Drew Leighton and Drew Tartier. Um, she's very sick, she's constantly on guard and paranoid again. Um, and, but, and she's immediately approached by the resistance in the area to help out, if they can use the farm, can they land planes in the back of the farm. And, and she's like, I'm too sick, I just need to like recover and then I'm, I, I will be all in. But at this time, Allied planes start crashing. You know, British, Canadian, American forces, planes start crashing in the fields in and around Barbizon and beyond. And so her friends in the village start coming to her and say, um, you know, I've got an American in my apple tree and he doesn't speak French and I don't know what to do with him. And like, or I've got someone, you know, Canadian in my haystack and he's injured. And, and so, and these are of course like young, young guys. And so um, she starts immediately getting involved and feeling compelled to help them. And, so she starts helping get it, get, you know, with not only translating for these, these guys that are, you know, falling out of the skies, but also getting them food, getting them shelter, and finding a way to get them out of France. Um, at the same time this is happening in Barbizon, there's a network of doctors that she knows in the city of Paris that are helping to hide and shelter um, <coughs> aviators, allied aviators all over the city. So, she connects with them and gets involved in this underground network to get flyers out. So she's providing food, her and Nadine are, even though at first all the farmers in the area made fun of them, now they're actually like doing pretty well with the farm, they got a lot of help. Um, she's working as a translator and aiding in the escape. And at the end of the war, as I mentioned, she hid five of them in um, Little Villa Squirrel for seven weeks, and um, th the thing that was interesting about the layer of that is like you saw the front of Villa Squirrel, but the back was a big courtyard, and then behind the courtyard was two little cottages. So that's where she hit, the flyers could hide. And they hid there all day, mm -hmm. and then at night she'd let them go outside to like smoke cigarettes and get some fresh air. So France is liberated in August of 1944, and this whole time, you know, for two months, Drew and Nadine have been hiding these flyers, and then the you know all of a sudden their barbers on there, everyone's partying in the streets, and they they like mend the flyers' uniforms and clean them up, and so Drew and Nadine walk out the front door of, of Villa Squirrel with these five guys, and everyone loses their minds because they can't believe that they've been there the whole time. So there's a big celebration, and so by the end of the war, 
Drew had overseen the escape of at least 32 American, British, and Canadian flyers and assisted in helping over 100 others escape France via the underground network. And this is that picture, it's a little bit better now, of, of the guys that were hiding at Villa Squirrel at the end of the war. And then after the war, when she wrote this little autobiography, um, she took a tour of the US talking about her experiences and reuniting with some of the guys that she helped save, like these guys, which is amazing. This is another article um, about her, bo her book about um, you know what she did during those years. These are Richter and Spellman, two other guys she saved. I'm not, I haven't identified these two yet. So that's the, basically the history behind the story of Goodnight from Paris. And um, you know, once again, like my other books, it's a lesser known story of a woman in history. Um, I, you know, she got some recognition then. She got a lot of awards from the different countries of the, of the flyers she helped. And then, you know, since then, I mean, I had never heard this story. I'd never heard of her before. Her autobiography is out of print. And so that's what compelled me to try to write it. And the interesting thing was the American expatriate community in Paris during the war was pretty small. And so there's other people that are in characters in the novel that she connected with in real life. And one of them was Dorothy Thompson who was another, I mean, look at it, like such a force. I'd never heard of her before. I mean, maybe in passing, but she was one of the biggest international journalists at the time when there weren't a lot of female American, I mean, female international journalists. She was living in Berlin in the 30s and was one of the only <coughs> journalists to interview Hitler ever. And um, she saw what was coming. She was the first to, wor to warn the world, to warn America about him. She saw, she saw from the start what was coming and pretty much predicted everything that happened in Europe and beyond. Um, she had a syndicated column that was in like every newspaper in the country. She had a radio show. And she was on Drew's show multiple times um, at night in Paris. This is a pitch, another picture I love. So. Um, in 1939, there was a pro-Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden that was organized by the German Bund in the US, and over 20,000 pro-Nazi Americans showed up in Madison Square Garden. And she was on her way to um, a, like a reception to honor her for something, and she just was like, no, I have to go. And she went and she stood or sat in the front row and started heckling all the speakers, and she had to get like escorted out of there because they were going to kill her. Like the guys were going to go after her. Um, and this is one of the many quotes. Um, one of the, this is in the book actually too. This crisis is not a Jewish crisis. It is a human crisis. We who are not Jews must speak, speak our sorrow, our disgust, and our indignation in so many voices that they will be heard. And this is in 1938. This is well before America got involved. Josephine Baker was also on Drew's radio show. Um, incredible entertainer, actress, singer, dancer. She fled America um, for more acceptance as an African-American woman in, the, in France. And to this day, she is one of the most revered entertainers um, in France. She, I don't go into this in the novel, but um, she aided the resistance because she could travel back and forth in different countries um, because she was so huge and famous. So she smuggled intelligence in her sheet music going back, traveling through different countries. And then I mentioned Sylvia Beach. She was the owner of Shakespeare and Company, um, first publisher of James Joyce's Ulysses, which is a fact that I guess I, I hadn't really realized that. Really good friend of Ernest Hemingway and um, was in prison with Drew in the zoo and also at the camp in the mountains. And um, I read some of her diaries and stuff because she didn't get out as quickly as some, a lot of her friends. Our friends and family had been trying to get her out, but she was still, I don't think she got out till the spring. After, um, after the winter there. So um, that is, in a nutshell, like the history behind the story. I love um, writing about less known women in history, women who changed their minds and changed the trajectory of their lives. Um, I also added this cover design stuff at the end because I feel like people um, like to hear about the inside baseball, inside process with this stuff. So I, um, my, my editor and I, we worked on three books out of the four together. And the last two, we were totally on the same page about cover. This one, I had some ideas. I made a Pinterest board. I gave them all this stuff. And I said to um, 
my husband Charlie, I'm like, all right, it doesn't have to be exactly what I want. I just don't want a big fat Eiffel Tower in the middle of the cover and nothing else because there's so many Eiffel Tower books everywhere. And I'm like, just please don't let them give me that. And this is the first round of covers they gave me. <laughs> so I was so bummed. And then Alicia's crushed because she loved these covers. Um, and apparently, um, Eiffel Towers sell books. Who knew? Like, I didn't realize that was a thing, but they do. But we went back to the drawing board and came up with, they sent me these three concepts. Um, this one has a radio, but I was like, I couldn't even tell it was a radio. It looks like a microwave. I don't even know. Like, I was like, no. And then this one looks very similar to a book that I still haven't remembered what the name of it is. It's like Radio Girls or something in the middle. But I really felt like, you know, this was a real woman in history. I feel like she should be on the cover somehow. So um, we ended up with a variation of this one, almost exactly this one, except they stuck a little Eiffel Tower in the corner of the little <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so you know, thank you. I'm sorry I was late. Um, this is just my little author PSA for all authors. Word of mouth is the best marketing. If you like a book, tell other people. Tell your book clubs and your libraries and your friends. Um, social media is also great if you're into that. Um, I have a mailing list where I send out just really about my events, in-person events, virtual events. I do a monthly historical happy hour webinar. It's virtual and live. And then I convert it to a, like YouTube and podcast. And um, it's every month I interview a new historical fiction author that um, I know or that has a new book coming out. or. And so this month, I'm super excited and kind of fangirling because I'm interviewing Elka Joshi, who wrote The Henna Artist. Um, and I loved that book. And she just wrote the third in the trilogy. The, the whole trilogy is great. The Henna Artist is my favorite. So that's April 17th. You can sign up on, for my newsletter or on my website if you want, if you're interested in that. And um, yeah, and so thank you for listening. And I'd love to take any questions. Thank you for your patience, too. Yes. Did you go back to Paris for research? Um, I didn't because of the timing of it with the pandemic and travel and my family and whatever. But I, it, I did go back this fall. Um, and we, my husband and I, I was such a nerd. Like I did little videos in front of different places that she was at, <laughs> like, including the American embassy, because she was friends with the ambassador. And so I started to do a little video in front of the embassy. And the, the soldiers out front were like, Get out. like, what are you doing? Like, I got yelled at. So <laughs> that didn't come out very good. I had to do it like by a side street. Like, there it is. So. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to interview love or family? You know, I wasn't. Um, I wrote the novel, and I was almost done with the draft. And then I was like, you know what? If this was my grandmother, like I would want to know that this was coming out. I, she must have some someone, and so I found her grandson on Ancestry.com, and I threw her, who didn't know her. It's like that's a whole other that's that's a whole other book. He didn't know her because he was adopted, but um, I met Tracy, the granddaughter, who did know her through the grandson David, and Tracy was actually generous enough to give me um, to send me her scrapbooks which is all the pictures you see in this are from her scrapbooks. I scanned them and sent them back to Tracy. So that was, that was amazing. Yeah? Do you find it more difficult to write about actual people than you do fictional characters? I always wonder how you fill in the conversations and guessing what they're saying with you. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I will tell you, this of the, of the four books, this was the hardest one by far because it's a real person. I didn't want, want to take too many liberties. I wanted to honor her story. Um, so I, I had the autobiography. I had a bunch of her letters that are archived at the Holocaust Museum um, in DC to sort of get a sense of her voice and the basic timeline. And um, you know, one of my historical fiction author friends like says, your author's notes are your best friend with this, these type of, type of projects. So my author's notes are very detailed because it basically says, you know, I tried to honor and stick to her narrative and story, but at the end of the day, it's fiction, and you have to write a book that's entertaining, hopefully, and has a beginning, middle, and end. And so um, my author's notes kind of say, like, here's what's fact, here's what's fiction, 
Here is where I had to have a composite character instead of several characters, you know, several real people um, for the sake of the narrative. That's like, those are the things that I, I did. So that's like seven pages long or something. So, yeah, yeah. What happened to her husband? So one of the reasons she got, and this isn't much of a spoiler, one of the reasons she got so involved with um, the resistance is because almost, almost right after he left for the war, he disappeared. And she didn't know what happened to him um, until, like, until like four years later. And so he had been killed. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Did she have to remarry after that? She married the head of the Paris International Tribune, the International Tribune in Paris, who actually, um, was, his name was Jeffrey Parsons, and he was head of the Globe, Boston Globe here for a while. Yeah. And she lived in Paris for most of the rest of her life, she, um, she had a couple of apartments in Paris. She had one in the country. And then in her 70s, I want to say, she moved back to California to be close to family. Yes? Yeah, so that was interesting. That's a great question. I really struggled with that because in her autobiography, her son's only mentioned once. And in the letters home, like I could not get a read on what happened, what that relationship was. So at my first draft, I included the son, but then I was like, I could not, I didn't have enough data. I just didn't feel right including it when I didn't know. And this was Tracy's father, that, the, who's still Tracy, the granddaughter. So I didn't, I ultimately did not end up including him, but um, obviously like she, she went to Paris and she left him behind with the father and they were estranged for some time and only um, kind of reconciled <laughs> when he was much older. Any other questions? <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for listening. Dick Haley's here to sell books if you're interested. Um, thank you. Stop me if I give you too much. No, I been to the new one in Paris, uh, but no, not the one in Lyon. Yeah, the new one in Paris was smaller. So it was the one in Paris. It was smaller than I thought. It was one friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to just sign this? Or sure. Sign this? Okay. It's fabulous. Oh, good to know. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for coming. Thanks.